archaeologist here at the Division of State History. Welcome to the second brown bag for May for Archaeology and Preservation Month. Uh, so today we have Sherry Marie Ellis, who's an archaeologist uh, that runs her own company, and she does a lot of great work around the state on several different projects. Uh, she also spends a lot of time in creepy abandoned buildings by herself. Um, we call her a cut ninja, um, and has not back yet. And then we also have Sarah Meeks, who is Senior Project Coordinator for Ogden City Corporation. So today's going to be an interesting presentation on how history and economic development coincide. So I'm not going to spend more time on here, so share. Today we're going to talk about the uh, Ogden Union Stockyard. Um, for those of you that don't know, the annual theme for the Division of State History, essentially, is transportation and movement. And I can think of no better property to represent what transportation can do and what movement can do for the economy of an area, for the identity of an area, than the Ogden Union Stockyard. Um, we tend to think about transportation and movement in terms of people. How do we get people to places how, more efficiently? But the transportation and movement of goods, of non-human products, um, is essential to the society as we know it. Um, it's what allows us to live in the places that we choose, as opposed to everybody being concentrated only where the resources are available. If we couldn't move products to people, we, we would basically all be stuck in one location. So um, it's, it's a really critical component of, of movement in this country. So the Ogden Union Stockyard is an excellent example of how move the movement of livestock, which in the human world when we consider livestock is, is ultimately a, a food product. Um, it changed the complexion of the Ogden area and the broader region in profound ways. Organized uh, stockyard operations started out in Ogden during the late 1800s as just a few stock pens between the Weber River and the Ogden Rail Yard. And the location of those facilities was not by accident. Um, in order to move, I mean, in, order to, in order to move the livestock, and in, associate, in association with meatpacking plants, in order to move finished product, they needed transportation. And the best place that they could get that in Ogden to move it across the country was the Ogden Rail Yard. Essentially, all of the railroads extending across the nation came into that yard at some point. Uh, over the coming decades, it was relocated, it, the stockyard, was relocated to the other side of the river and grew into a sprawling complex of specialized barns, corrals, auction arenas, and the headquarters of the Ogden Livestock Exchange. As early as the 1920s, the yard had become the largest stockyard operation west of Denver, and more than a million hogs, sheep, cattle, and other livestock made their way through the facility each year. The stockyard site became a demonstration of industrialization and progressive era agriculture with a layout of the yard reflecting advancing concepts of workflow, integration of the rail system for mass transport of livestock, close coordination with the meatpacking industry, and extensive incorporation of new technologies to facilitate sanitation. The livestock industry has long progressed hand in hand with the meatpacking industry, not surprising. Prior to the industrialization of meatpacking, butchering of animals typically took place at home, on a local farm, or at small butcher shops like this one from Salt Lake City. Americans, particularly those in urban areas, appreciated the convenience of packaged meat as opposed to having to raise livestock on their own. But urban butchers could only process so many animals a day given the manual labor involved and consumer choices were limited. Due to a lack of effective methods to keep the processed meat cool during long distance transport prior to the early 1900s, most fresh meat available in the urban areas of the West came from local livestock. Prior to the invention of reliable refrigeration in rail, in rail cars, transport of live animals around the country was the norm. In the decades after the Civil War, Chicago rose as the livestock dis distribution center of the country. This was due in large part to the plethora of railroad connections in the city, as well as the role the city had played in distributing supplies to soldiers via rail during the war. From Chicago, livestock would be shipped directly to eastern states or driven via stock drives to secondary distribution centers, such as those in Kansas City. 
During the stock drives, some of which uh, cross more than 1,200 miles, it was not uncommon for livestock to die or to lose a substantial percentage of their body weight. Along with reductions in weight came lower sales prices for the live animal or for having less finished product, essentially less meat. With the problems associated with livestock deaths, injury, dehydration, and malnutrition that arose in the course of long distance transport, particularly by rail, but also via, via the stock drives, came a social and economic backlash against railroad companies to provide better conditions for animals. In addition to new railroad stock cars that provided in-transport feeding and watering facilities, railroad companies invested in pens and way stations along their routes where animals could be temporarily offloaded and provided with food and water. They also established more traditional feedlots at railheads where livestock could be finished or fattened up with high calorie feed before sending them off to slaughter. The rail companies charged fees for using the facilities but soon recognized that combining the various aspects of the meat industry in the same location would increase their profits. As such, they began creating subsidiary companies that dealt in all manner of livestock transport, slaughtering, butchering, packaging, and meat distribution. One of the earliest large-scale examples of this was the Chicago Union Stockyard. In 1865, a consortium of nine railroad companies, all of which had started small-scale meatpacking operations around Chicago, consolidated their efforts in the Union Stockyard. The massive yard, which included transport pens, a feedlot, uh, slaughterhouses, and meatpacking plants, eventually it covered 475 acres. The concept behind the facility was that live animals would be transported by various means to the yard from local or regional sources that were not too distant, thereby minimizing weight loss and fatalities of, of the animals, and finished meat products would be shipped out of the yard uh, to all parts of the country via the, via the massive rail system. By processing the livestock at the yard and transporting only the edible products across greater distances, profit margins could be greatly increased. The layout of the Chicago yard with its integration of railroads and trucking facilities became a model for subsequent stockyards built across the country, including the Ogden Union Stockyard. The Union Stockyards of Chicago are, for all intents and purposes, the birthplace of the industrial slaughterhouse. The, uh, the first large-scale slaughterhouse and meatpacking plant was constructed adjacent to the yards, the Chicago yards, in 1867 by the Armour Brothers of Armour Hot Dog fame, if you've all got that little jingle now running through your head. Uh, the plant brought to the industry the most, uh, the most advanced technologies in meatpacking that came out of the American Industrial Revolution. They included mechanized uh, killing wheels and conveyor systems, and a moving assembly line, or maybe more accurately, disassembly line of machinery. It was amidst these technological advancements and myriad uh, recently enacted food safety laws that the Ogden Union stockyards came to be in the early 1900s. Not surprisingly, the impetus for the yards came from members of the meatpacking industry. Specifically, a group of Ogden area businessmen, the majority of whom were officers of the recently established Ogden Packing and Provision Company, incorporated the stockyards on July 29, 1916. The new establishment was called the Ogden Union Stockyard Company, and its primary purpose at that time was to provide for the steady movement of sheep, hogs, and cattle to the meat packing plant, which was located across the Weber River to the east. By 1917, when the new stockyard officially opened, the Ogden Packing and Provision Company was reportedly the largest meat packing plant west of the Missouri River. The capacity of the plant at that time was enormous, more than local ranchers could supply through the few stock pens that had been located there at the plant itself. This resulted in the, com in the company not only leading the way to establish the Ogden Union stockyards across the river, but also launching a concerted campaign to encourage ranchers to increase their herd sizes, particularly for hogs, even going so far as to purchase and distribute breed, uh, brood sows throughout the West and advancing payments to ranchers to allow them to expand their herds. <clears throat> Contracts for the construction of the first part of the new stockyards were let in October 1916 to James Stewart and Company, a St. Louis-based firm with experience at the Chicago Union Stockyard. 
Within a few days, the grounds of the 70-acre Ogden Yard were graded and concrete floors for buildings and pens were poured. Within the yard, stamped concrete in different, hello, in different patterns, uh, marked pathways, paths or walkways where livestock were herded to and from the loading chutes along the north side of the yard, through the middle of the yard, and to the scale houses, pens, and specialized livestock barns. The paving, combined with an elaborate sewer drain and piped water system, were specifically implemented to facilitate cleaning of the yard and to improve animal welfare. I will add on an aside, though, that they pretty much just washed everything into the adjacent Weber River without actually treating it. So the yards were clean, the river not so much. Uh, the first phase of the stockyards opened in April 1917, and within a few months, the new yards had become the bustling center of a burgeoning livestock industry. Numerous railroad companies built spur lines to the stockyards to claim a piece of the financial action in transporting livestock to the yards and meat products away from the packing plant. But it was the Union Pacific that garnered the lion's share of the rail traffic. Ultimately, seven rail lines converged at the stockyards and meatpacking plant, and trainloads of cattle, sheep, hogs, and horses were arriving daily to be placed on the Ogden market. The gentle arc of the rail line required by the trains to enter and exit the stockyard and pass through the adjacent rail yard dictated at least some of the layout of the stockyard, with loading docks along the north side of the yard being constructed in an arc formation um, along the south side of those tracks. And this is an older photo. The tracks have been removed, and we're sort of talking about this area. The trains would come in this way. Um, the loading areas were up here. You can see these little, this little sort of feature right here. That's a, that's a later set of loading docks I'll talk about in a second, but they basically replaced um, the original ones. Uh, after their opening, the stockyards were described in the Ogden Standard Examiner as being, quote, declared by stockmen to be the finest stockyards in the entire West. The sheep and hog yards are all under roof, two mammoth sheds of heavy construction covering these pens. The flooring is entirely concrete with excellent drainage facilities and complete sewage and water systems. Concrete troughs are used with the latter. Cattle and horses are placed in heavily constructed pens connected by runways to both the scales houses and the loading chutes. These outside yards are also built with concrete flooring and the same facilities as the covered yards. By 1920, the stockyards were reportedly handling up to 10,000 head of livestock per day, and six livestock commission firms were said to be operating out of the yards. And I want to stop and just think for a minute what it means to move 10,000 head of animals through, through a place in a day. That's, that's more than one, one animal a minute for, for 24 hours. It's, it's, that is a lot of livestock moving through that, that area. By 1922, the Ogden Yards had become one of the largest western markets for cattle, hogs, and sheep, necessitating the construction of a new $30,000 exchange building to house the administrators and commission firms operating out of the yard. In 1926, the Golden Spike Coliseum was constructed. Uh, designed by noted Utah architect Leslie Hodgson, the Coliseum housed an auction arena, dance floor, conf conference room, uh, offices and a restaurant. The construction of the facility was necessi necessitated by the success of the annual livestock show and the numbers of visitors uh, attending each year. In 1930, the rail and loading chute network was expanded to accommodate daily activity of 200 train carloads of cattle, 250 carloads of sheep, 150 carloads of hogs, and 100 tr truckloads of mixed livestock and a new sheep barn was constructed. Uh, Double-decker loading ramps uh, were located along the north perimeter yard and were constructed uh, during this time as well. And they reflect the need uh, for increased loading and offloading efficiency of an industrial stockyard. The following year, in 1931, the Art Deco Exchange Building, um, also designed by Hodgson, was completed. The yard itself was expanded to 75 acres that encompassed 30 acres of pens, barns, and railroad switches, and 45 acres of buildings, parking, way scales, and other facilities. After struggling through the Great Depression, the stockyard once again expanded during the wartime boom of the 1940s, seeing an additional 80 sheep pens added to the, added to the stockyard. 
This was due in large part to a multi-million dollar federal government contract obtained by the Ogden Packing and Provision Company to provide meat to the military during the war years. Concurrent with the expansion of the stockyards, the adjacent meat packing plant embarked upon its own upgrade, erecting a four-story addition to their plant to increase the slaughter of locally procured hogs from 1,000 a week to 10,000 a week. Let's see. So this, this was what they called the, por the pork plant or the pork building. That is the addition that was built at that time. Uh, most of the animals that fed into uh, this, pl this plant uh, certainly came through the Ogden Yard. The final round of known improvements at the stockyard occurred in 1954, making the stockyards the single largest livestock facility west of Denver. Shortly after the final expansion effort, the stockyard operation began a slow but inevitable decline toward obsolescence. By the 1960s, annual sales through the yard had declined to less than half of what it had been in its heyday. Advancements in long-haul trucking minimized the need for centralized stockyards at a regional level and resulted in the dispersal of operations to, large, to a larger number of smaller yards located off the nation's railroad network. By the mid-1960s, the fundamental shift in how meat products were distributed across the country relegated the Ogden Union Stockyard to local use, which proved insufficient to sustain the vast facility. The stockyard was officially closed on January 31, 1971. The nearby meat packing plant had shuttered its operations a year earlier, shortly after the demise of the stockyard's main operations. In the ensuing years, portions of the facility were dismantled and much of the yard became a surplus materials storage site for the Smith & Edwards Company. More recently, Ogden City has been redeveloping the land as a business park, allowing it to once again serve as an economic engine for the city. And Sarah is going to talk about that. And um, we're going to take, have, a, have some questions. If you have any, I have a question first for you guys. Does anybody other than Sarah and I think that the choice of footwear by these young ladies was a sort of sketchy for a day at a stockyard? <laughs> We're sort of figuring, you know, I mean, here to hear dad saying, you know, hey girls, wear your best. We might get to pose with the champion steer today. <laughs> any, any questions for me? Go ahead. On the meat packing plant, did that turn into Swiss? It did. Okay. Yeah, Swift took over um, the plant sort of about the 1930s or so. Do any of these buildings still exist? Uh, the exchange building at the stockyard is still there. And for now, I think the meat packing plant <laughs> is still standing. Okay. The other, the barns, the barns, corrals, all, the, all those other facilities, as far as I know, at the stockyard are no, are no longer. They have been demolished. Okay, so I'm Sarah, and I work for the Ogden City Business Development Division. I actually used to be an archaeologist, but I uh, went back to school and changed careers a few years back. So I was pretty surprised when I started working at the city, and one of the first projects that I was assigned to was a redevelopment project at the historic stockyards which turned out to be a massive archaeological site. So I was really excited to be involved with this project and to see how a redevelopment project at a historic site would come together. Um, generally, the, the redevelopment project that the city has been working on is called the Ogden Business Exchange. And that project has created a new um, business park at the stockyard site. And the design of that business park is really oriented around the history of the site and also its access to very unique outdoor features. So this is an aerial photo from 2007 of the project site, um, kind of picking up where Sherry left off. The stockyards closed in the 1970s. Um, and after that, the site was split into multiple ownerships and for a long time, it more or less sat vacant. Um, some of the properties were being used for storage of surplus material, but there was not a lot of activity going on at the site. You can see on here, um, even in 2007, some of the pens and corrals were still standing. I don't okay, so this was a big section of pens and corrals that was still standing when we started working on the project. Um, but there were a lot of other outbuildings that were pretty dilapidated. You can see here this was the sheep barn that had partially collapsed, had a bunch of trees growing through it. 
Um, and then there were large sections of the site where all of the old corrals had been kind of pushed over, so up in here, and there was just all kinds of material being stored at the site. There were probably thousands of railroad ties, there were lots of unmarked barrels and containers that were pretty scary. Um, so it was in pretty rough condition by 2007. Um, as Sherry mentioned, the exchange building located up here was still standing, um, and the city is working towards the restoration of that building, but a lot of this other, um, a lot of the rest of the site has been cleared. Um, in, a, in an older city like Ogden, it's pretty rare to encounter this large of a property that is vacant or underutilized. So this site's about 50 acres, um, and the city really recognized that as an opportunity um, to redevelop that site and put it back into a more productive use. Um, we also saw the potential of the site just based on its location. So it has great access to transportation networks, and it's a really pretty spot. I know you can't tell from this photo, but uh, the site's kind of nestled in a curve of the Weber River. Um, it has great access to our existing trail system, and there are also some pretty fantastic views of the Wasatch Range from out here. Um, but along with the potential, there were lots of challenges. Um, if any of you have been involved with urban redevelopment projects, some of these will sound familiar to you. Um, but first, the city had to acquire property that was owned by multiple different owners. That's always a challenge. Um, and then we also had to do quite a bit of environmental remediation. So the site was considered a brownfields because of its history as the stockyard and also because of some of those more recent use, in particular the storage of material at the site. You can see here this was an underground storage tank that was uncovered during construction. Um, that was found in what was believed to be a mechanics pit, so that's, that's the kind of thing you really have to have environmental consultants on hand who know how to deal with that type of material and make sure it's removed and disposed of safely. Um, other site development costs that we encountered were uh, clearing the concrete from the site. I think Sherry described to you all um, the concrete surface that covered the whole site and the concrete drainage system that laid beneath that. Um, while that was an amazing feat of engineering, it's not the kind of thing that you can build on top of. So a major challenge was removing that concrete drainage system from the site. And you can see the scale of that in the bottom right photo here. Um, so as that concrete was removed, we had a crusher on site and tried to reuse as much of the crushed concrete on site as we could. This is also the type of redevelopment project that just is not feasible without public investment. And so the city had to get pretty creative in terms of putting together a capital stack that could fund the redevelopment of the site. So we used funding from HUD, EPA, EDA, which is the Economic Development Administration, and also city funding, both from our capital improvements program and from tax increment financing. And I'll just uh, I'll add a note here that it was because we were using federal funds that we initiated the Section 106 process for this project, and that's what led to a lot of the documentation work that we've done with Sherry and, and a number of other consultants um, and ongoing mitigation efforts for the site. So as we were working on addressing some of those challenges, we were also working to develop a vision for this new business park. Many of you may know that a lot of Ogden's recent economic growth has been driven by our outdoor industry. Um, starting with the Winter Olympics in 2002, we were fortunate to have community leaders that looked around and recognized what an asset it was to have so many recreation opportunities within and adjacent to Ogden. Um, so the city and the community really began to rebuild itself around access to the outdoors. Um, we began a really concerted effort to recruit companies that were in the outdoor industry and bring them to Ogden. Um, we've had quite a bit of success with that with companies such as Amher Sports, which is the parent company for Atomic and Solomon Skis, uh, Rosignol, Scott, all of these companies have operations in Ogden. And They've had a really significant impact on the community. So not just in terms of the jobs that they've created, but in the way 
that they have engaged with the community. So um, these companies and their employees have gotten involved with everything from building trails to volunteering in the schools. And it's made quite an impact on Ogden. So as we set out to develop this new business park, we wanted to continue that growth of the outdoor industry at Ogden. And we tried to design um, a site that would really appeal to those companies. So this was one of the original concept designs for the site. And there's a few things I just want to point out here. Um, tried to orient the larger buildings towards the river as much as possible and take advantage of that incredible asset that's right there. Um, this building has actually since been constructed and it does have a great outdoor patio that opens up onto the river. Um, we also wanted to make sure that companies located at this park had the flexibility to design flagship buildings that reflected their brands and reflected their products. Um, we do have some other great real estate options in Ogden, but the largest and most notable is Business Depot Ogden. Um, and the design standards there are quite strict, so companies can only lease property, um, and most of the buildings have a similar look and feel. So we wanted something where companies could really differentiate their buildings. Um, and then also, most importantly, we wanted to provide the amenities that employees of these companies are looking for. Um, so the stockyard site was really the ideal location for this type of project, thanks to its proximity to transportation networks, but also to outdoor amenities like the river. Um, although this is a rendering, it shows some of the work that has been completed to date on the project. Um, so we had acquired all the property. The environmental remediation is done. Um, it turned out not to be as extensive as it might have been, but just doing the assessment and making sure that there were no hazards on the site was, was very expensive. Um, the site has also been cleared, and all of the infrastructure is new or upgraded, um, and the sites are, are ready to develop. So just a few things to point out on here. This is a new loop road that went in. Um, these walking trails are in. They connect the business park out to some open space. And then two leading cycling brands are already located at the business park. So Envy Composites is located here, and Cell Royale is located down here. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of the infrastructure upgrades that had to be made, um, probably the most notable in my experience on the project was a new 24-inch water line. We didn't have sufficient water service at the site when we started, and so this new water line came from east of the rail yard, was bored under the rail yard, across the Weber River, and out to the site here. Uh, we also had to bring in power lines from two different locations, and we had to go through a lengthy process with FEMA to do a revision to the floodplain mapping for this area. So that kept us pretty busy for a few years. Um, these are just some images of work that is complete or underway at the site now. Um, Envy Composites is a company that's homegrown in Ogden, and they have built a new 70,000 square foot facility at this business park. Um, it's really exciting to go through their facility and see that level of manufacturing happening here in the United States. And they're a great example of uh, certain types of advanced manufacturing that is tending to come back to the States uh, and creating really high quality jobs in our communities. So we're just thrilled about at that NV project. Um, Cell Royale is the other cycling company. They have an R&D facility at the park. And then our local favorite roosters, of course, um, they're building a new brewery just across from the, from the business park. So our office continues to work on the business recruitment side of things, looking for companies to come in um, take the remaining properties at the business park. We're also focused on building more amenities. So just to give you an idea, uh, we've recently submitted grant applications to rebuild the Ogden Kayak Park, which is on the Weber River, and another application for funding to help develop a new mountain bike park that sits between the business park and the river. Um, we're also moving forward with plans to see the historic exchange building restored and adapted for use. Um, it was built as an office building. We'd like to see it put back into that use. Then I just wanted to touch quickly on that transportation theme and how that continues to play a, a really important role at the Ogden Business Exchange. 
Um, access to good transportation networks remains an important decision driver for businesses today. Um, here in Salt Lake and Ogden, we're lucky to be really well situated for this. Uh, we have great access to I-15 and I-80, the Salt Lake International Airport, and then Union Pacific has an intermodal terminal here in Salt Lake, which is important to a lot of companies because they can bring in freight by rail and then do the drayage by truck for the last 60 miles. So we, can see, we continue to see that be a reason why companies are choosing to locate in Salt Lake and in Ogden. However, more and more we're seeing that companies are deciding where to locate based on their ability, ability to attract and retain the best talent. Um, even in the short time that I've been working in economic development over the last four or five years, we've seen this really come to the fore as a major decision driver. So as we were designing the Ogden Business Exchange and thinking about how to include amenities that would help companies bring in top talent, um, there were several amenities that are transportation related. So adjacent to the business park is the uh, Centennial Trail, which is a paved multimodal trail. Um, it's part of a 27 mile loop that runs through Ogden. Um, and that's really important to companies like Envy Composites who want to make sure that their employees can bike to work or go out and cycle on their lunch break. Um, really a pretty important decision factor for them. And then in the design of some of the new infrastructure at the site, um, you can see here, this is an image from during construction. So it looks, it's, uh, it looks better and has more landscaping now, but you can see um, the new sidewalk and then a separated cycle track here to give some additional protection to the cyclists. And then this is the concept design for the mountain bike park that I mentioned. Um, so this is going in. This is the north edge of the business park here. Weber River's up here. And these are those loading platforms that Sherry showed you. So um, the goal is to preserve those loading platforms and some of the stamped concrete that still exists around them. Um, that would become a public plaza. And that's also where we would likely have some of the historical interpretation for the site. And then in the open space north of there, uh, we have this great design for a mountain bike park with really unique features um, for bikers to come and, and work on their skills and host events in this area. There are also some walking trails and sitting areas through here, so this isn't exclusively for, for your hardcore mountain bikers. Um, so this is the type of amenity that we're seeing really does make an impact on businesses. It, it helps them with talent attraction, it can help with employee morale and productivity, and then for cycling brands like Envy, they can actually get out and test their products in this type of uh, facility. So um, one thing that's been interesting to see is that these types of amenities are not just important for outdoor companies. It seems like more and more companies in other industries like tech are seeking the same type of lifestyle amenities that they can use to differentiate themselves and, and really recruit the best employees. So we're excited to see the project move along and we're looking forward to seeing what happens next at the Ogden Business Exchange. It remains a big priority for the city and um, we hope to see it become and remain an economic engine for Ogden for a long time to come. Any questions? Yeah. Can you tell us about the kayak park? The kayak park uh, was built, I believe, in the early 2000s by the city. Um, had some county ramp funding, which is, I think, the zap, the zap tax down here in Salt Lake County. We call it the ramp program up in Weber County. Um, and then a huge volunteer effort by local kayakers went into originally building the kayak park. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it's, it's deteriorated. It's no longer really functional as the way it was designed. Um, and so we have a design to restore it and improve it so that it's better than it was when it was first built. Um, and we've just submitted a grant application to the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation to see if we can get some funding to get that built. And that would be part of a larger effort to make some improvements along that stretch of the Weber River. Um, if you go back there by where the Swift plant is, um, the banks are really undercut, and so the river's just not in great shape right there. So we're trying to work on river improvements and putting the kayak park back. Yeah? I have a live streaming question. Um, someone wants to know where exactly the project is in Ogden. Sure, it is just north of 24th Street, west of the viaduct. So. Um, if you take the 24th Street exit or you're coming from Ogden and you go over the 24th Street viaduct, 
you'll turn north on B Avenue, um, and it's just down at B Avenue and Exchange Road. Yeah? Do you have a uh, timeline on uh, what they're going to tear down the Swift building yet? Um, not yet. There's an, a major environmental remediation that has to happen before the building can be demolished. We're looking at a cost of about, I think, $1.3 to do the environmental cleanup on that building. And so right now we're going after some EPA funding that could potentially help with that. Chris. So what's the plan for the SWIFT plan area? Is it just an extension of this kind of business? Area? Yeah, the idea is that it would become more, um, more space for the business park. It's kind of a tough location for other types of redevelopment because it's sandwiched in between the rail yard and Brentag, which is a chemical plant. And so it's a little tough to see something other than um, kind of that light industrial use going in there, at least as it sits at present. But, yeah. What happened to the exchange? Trying to get it restored and put back into use. Um, we've had some delays on the project. We would have liked to be further along with that than we are at present. Um, but there's a new developer involved with the project that I believe is now under contract with CRSA to help us get some as-built drawings for the building and move forward with um, the most immediate stabilization needs while we put together the rest of the funding to do the full restoration. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah. Oh yeah, so a um, couple things on that. So. Heritage Festival in Weber County is happening at the Union Station this Saturday, I think from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, it's a great time to go up and check out the museums at the station if you haven't done that before. Um, there's also a World War II exhibit that's on display there right now that's supposed to be really, really good. Um, and then Rhonda Lauritsen with Evalog Life has done quite a bit of history on the Swift Building um, and with the Smith family use of that building in more recent years. So she'll have a booth at Heritage Festival um, and her focus is going to be on the stockyard. So she's working on a collection of historic photographs, oral histories, vignettes. Um, and she's also building off a lot of work that Weber State Special Collections has done. And I'm going to give you the URL for that. Um, so if you go to ogdenstockyard.org, um, that's the site that Rhonda's been working on. Uh, you'll see it's still a work in progress, but it's a great place to keep an eye on. Uh, she'll be adding new photos and new vignettes. Um, kind of as she, as she works on that project. And she's also got links out to Don Strack's amazing collection of historic photographs of the stockyards, and then links out to that Weber State Special Collections. They've created a whole digital collection where you can go and listen to oral histories and see photographs of the stockyards. So I have one last question for both of you. What was the biggest surprise or complexity for this project? From cultural resource perspective and also the project coordinator perspective? Uh, from, the, from the cultural resource perspective, it, it was just the enormity, I think. I mean, it's not a surprise, but it was sort of the most challenging part of it. Um, the enormity and, and just the, the complexity of the site itself, how features were connected to each other, um, it, that, that just trying to document <laughs> that and get your brain around that, for me, was, was a little bit of a of a challenging thing. I had spent a little bit of time there as a, as a kid. We'd ride our bikes over after it had shut down and wander around out there. And so I had a little bit of familiarity, but until I went back to think about how it functioned as a site, how things moved through the site when it was functioning, I hadn't really thought about just how, how big it <laughs> was and how much was going on there. Well, I was really glad I wasn't the one that had to document it, first of all, because it was a little bit overwhelming. And um, I was just really impressed by the work that Sherry did. And then also IO Landscape Architecture did a HALS documentation of the site. And I was really just blown away by the level of detail they were able to get in the documentation of a very large, complex site. Um, but I think from the redevelopment standpoint, the most complex thing was putting together the funding to make it happen and how many different funding sources we had to line up. Um, in order to make it economically feasible. Um, and of course, each funding source comes with its own uh, strings and requirements. And so making sure that we were doing what was required for each source of funding that we added to the stack. It was definitely a big learning curve. <laughs>
What environmental issues are left in the SWIFT building that are going to be dealt with? So, <laughs> see how fast she gets out of here. <laughs> um, so there are just a lot of unmarked containers with unknown substances in them that have to be sampled. <laughs> Party. Yeah, it's like a surprise party. <laughs> um, so that's the biggest challenge is, is doing the sampling and disposal because right now there's just there's a lot more characterization that's needed of the site just because there's so much in there that's not marked. Okay, thanks.